My name is Alison Skilbeck and my show is called Alison Skilbeck's Uncommon Ground. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's just a, did you say you were Alison Skilbeck? Yes. Oh, yeah, so I should probably say I'm Tim Hardy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, sorry. Um, should we do it once more? No, this is adorable. My name is Tim Hardy and I'm doing a play which is called The Trials of Galileo, which is about Galileo. Yeah. <laughs> How do you know each other for the people that don't know you? Oh. Well, we <laughs> are married to each other. We got married in 1998, but we actually met in 1985 at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre where we were acting together. And so we've been together ever since. 30 something years. Yeah, yes. amazing. 38 years. Yeah. 38 wow. years. Yeah. And, and it was a season of plays, one of which then transferred to Greenwich and then the West End. <clears throat> so we had a lot of time to kind of get it together. There was a season of plays at the Bristol Vic and one of them was um, going to be a musical about Judy Garland and the being actor in the company and the other productions and suddenly he decided he didn't want to be in the musical about Judy Garland to play the role of Joe Mankiewicz and Tim had a call from his agent saying, would you like to go down to Bristol to play Joe Mankiewicz? And I thought, mm. it was a lovely line of parts mm. as well, but particularly Joe Mann was really interesting because I knew a little bit about Judy Garland, like we all do, and everybody said he was the one man who maybe could have been the right man for her because he mm. was strong, self-confident, talented, successful, mm. but he was married and that was that. And I thought, this is really quite interesting, and, and it was. But <clears throat> there's this man called Ian Reddington, whom I've never met, and he changed my life <laughs> by leaving the company and letting me in. <laughs> so Tim was playing this glamorous film director in Judy, and I was playing the gossip columnist Hedda Hopper, who was about nine feet tall and used to wear very big hats, including hats that looked like typewriters, and she was venomous, wasn't she? It was horrible. Oh. So I was being tall and venomous, yeah. but then you were being glam. I was being glamorous, <laughs> like you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there, no, we... we, we we got together and, um, you know, we were back in London. What kind of drew you to each other in the beginning, in those early days? What happens when you join a company, it's a big company and you're doing a lot of plays, mm. is you have a big read-through and a big introductory session. And everyone in this particular company was introduced by the director, who was very good at remembering names, so about 30 names to remember. And when he came to Tim Hardy, I saw this chap sitting there with wonderful Sorry, dark curly hair, <laughs> and he was wearing a kind of grey and black sweatshirt. And I promise you, I could see this cloud of misery yeah. over his head because his mm. marriage had just broken up and the children and everything. And um, because about three days into rehearsal, he kind of pulled himself up and became oh, relatively life and soul of the party for the time we were rehearsing. I think, you know, and showed me what his humour was like and his fun and all of that. Um, and the energy, and you just never know, do you? Of course, he is half Italian as well. <laughs> lent him a certain je ne sais quoi. That's <laughs> French. <laughs> um, what about me? Oi. Uh, well, it, it is very hard to put into words. You know, why do you love one piece of music and not another? It's all very subjective. But I knew that I was in a very bad state and that <clears throat> I needed to be careful not just to, you know, on the bounce, just grab something and say, look, look, I'm still alive. You can't do that for people. But I just sensed that, I sensed that Alison saw me, which was a good start. And obviously I, I found it very attractive because what do I find attractive? I'm very attracted to talent. I am quite a talent snob. <laughs> um, if somebody has no talent, I have no further interest. In <laughs> Unless they say I've got no talent, indeed. But if they <laughs> tell you they've got talent and they can't do it, I, I go cold. Well, Alison was the opposite. I thought, crikey, you know, she can really act. And she knew exactly who she was and what she wanted, um, which was, had a strength about it, which I knew I needed. What made you both decide to get into acting in the first place? Oh, gosh. After you. Big question again. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. I was sort of focused on the academic. I went to a very good grammar school. My parents wanted me to you know, be successful academically. I went to Oxford to read English, uh, Spanish and French languages. And when I did languages at school, I was very well taught. 
and the teacher sort of told you to kind of take on the persona of a French person or a Spanish person. And I think that was a kind of acting thing as well. So I really enjoyed that. And I did plays at school as well. And when I was at Oxford, I did a lot of plays for the University of Dramatic Societies. And came up here actually in the Oxford Review way back in 1967. Um, so I loved it, but I didn't have the guts immediately to sort of leap onto the stage. And for a couple of years, I did various things. I lectured in languages, and, and I actually was married early on as well, far too early. And my then husband said something quite pathetic. He said, uh, why don't you have a go? Mm. I don't want a bored 40-year-old on my hands. <laughs> well, he didn't get a bored 40-year-old, because I sort of got in touch with people who might have seen me at the university, and I got jobs after job in community theatre and repertory theatre. And, uh, and then eventually, really, sort of the gears meshed when I joined Sir Alan Akeborn's company in Scarborough and was there for five years. And that was my real apprenticeship. apprenticeship. So that's what got me into it. But I'd always, I'd always loved it. I loved the feeling of the words. I loved the feeling of being on stage. I just needed that to push. And um, there you go. And it's been a learning process ever since, right up to this very moment after this morning's show, because that's what you do. I was, um, I was at a very <coughs> ferociously high level of academia at school. And I discovered when I was at this school, an old boys school that was founded in 1509, it's a traditional go-go, um, that if I did my very best in any of the disciplines, whether it was academic or sports, my very best was just about average, if not that. And then one day, somebody was waiting for me after class and said, would you like to play Antonio the Sea Captain? In twelfth night, I said, "You've got the wrong guy. I don't do acting." He said, "No, we've actually tried everybody else. Um, you're our last hope." I said, "What is in bottom of the barrel?" He said, "Yeah," and he was desperate. Uh, somebody had dropped out, and so he said, "Look, you haven't got time to do any acting. Just learn the line, which is as good an introduction to acting as anybody, because none of us should act. You just say the lines." And so I did it for him, really, and found that I actually quite enjoyed it. I liked the you know, taste of the words in my mouth. Mm. And so that was that, and we finished. And we were celebrating in the tuck shop, and lemonade and buns. And, <laughs> and this um, voice said, well done, boy, you're quite good at this. And it was my housemaster. And it was the first time anybody had said I was good at St. Paul's, at anything. And that was the only reason why I thought, I'm going to try this again, not because I love it, because somebody else said I'm good at it. <laughs> and it grew from there. By the time I left the school, I was playing all the leading roles. And that's how it took. And then I thought, I want to be an actor, which was horrifying. My mother and grandmother had spent all this money on a private education. Um, and they said, here's the deal. You can audition for RADA, which is well, the top drama school. And if you don't get in there, you forget it. Deal. Well, I got in. And that's how it started. Yeah. Yeah, and because you were saying about the validation in that moment, is that kind of what acting is a little bit about? Like you get that praise from the audience and it's yeah. this kind yes. of, yeah, this high? Yeah. Yeah. If you're really, and this is why it's particularly valuable during theatre in small spaces, because you really, well, you see the audience, I certainly do in my venue, you, you feel them, you almost smell them, and you, you learn to kind of detect when it's when it's working, when it's really you know, and you're holding them to the end and they're, they're really responding. They don't have to laugh, belly laugh, whatever. Mm. They don't have to, to weep, but you feel that energy coming across. And that's that's the validation you want. Mm. You know, you, you don't want, um, well, Oscars would be nice, etc. But you don't, you don't want that. You, you want that in-the-moment experience of people having the life life experience that you can give them to the best of your ability. And that's what helps you to go on learning, too. So, for example, I had a very quiet audience this morning. But by the end, they were probably the most attentive they've been for the last bit, which mm. needs that concentration. And, uh, you know, they, I, I really felt that. So I thought, well, it's been a journey, but we got there. When you're in small spaces, mm. it's a two-way conversation. And so the audience is crucial. Um, somebody said to me once about teaching, you're only ever as intelligent as the students you're teaching. And that's true. They can make you really stupid if they just give you nothing. And it's a bit the same with an audience that is ungiving, and, and like Alison, mine this morning was entirely quiet, but I could see them enough to see just how rapt they were. And there comes a point when it's clear that my character Galileo has been cheated on when I say, you've forgotten the special edict, and this woman in the front row went, <laughs> like that. 
And I thought, this is just wonderful. And you are retelling the story if you do your job properly every day. You have to reinvent it, not this is what I do here. And because it's a fresh new audience. And, you know, when it's like what we're experiencing at the moment, absolute joy and I'm playing in a small space but I am selling out every day and even that at the beginning when I'm sitting at the desk and I see them all piling in excited and looking for it I think it is it is so encouraging so yeah it's a wonderful experience and as Alison says we, le we learn something every day yeah so is that what makes the fringe so special compared to other kinds of audiences Yes, I, th I think so. I mean, the, the fringe or, or a similar experience, but I mean, there's, there's the atmosphere here because there's so much going on. But it is that, that intimacy and that feeling of, of the real life present moment experience, which I mean, I'm, I'm fighting for now because, you know, where are we going to get it? Because people are on their phones all the time, as soon as recorded as telly. And we have to keep the real life experience alive, the breathing space where we're actually here and now. You know, as we are now sitting on this plinth, the row of the filming as well. Mm. It's it's that magic of being alive moment to moment, every breath we take. So they do say that in live theatre, um, an audience and a performance, your heart starts to beat at the same rate, and you beat yes. together. So that's mm. it. 